Hello and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Buy Round interview show. Uh, today we are joined by a man with uh, such a long list of accomplishments, uh, both in teams and individually, uh, including, which I think is just a testament to the the player that you were, being named in Australia's 100, or greatest ever 100 players. Uh, you also have a an incident with a chair, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> infamous for. Uh, welcome, Laurie Daly. No worries, Jimmy. Great to be here, mate. Yeah, really looking forward to, mm. to getting stuck into things. Um, how are you, mate? Uh, all good? Yeah, I'm all good. Yeah, it's exciting time of the year, obviously. It is an exciting time of year, mm. isn't it? Especially in positions like ours. This is, you know, you, you're not out there playing anymore or coaching but it but it is cool to to, to witness and yeah. there's no better seat than in that commentary box no it's great i mean to be able to still go and watch the footy commentate on the footy talk about it all the time uh is wonderful because when you finish your football career a lot of people are a little bit lost um and i was quite lucky that i wasn't lost i was able to stay involved in the game and still have that connection so i feel as though i'm quite lucky um, and to be doing it, you know, 23 years after you're retired and still going, um, I feel very honoured. Hey, uh, what is the secret to longevity in this game? I'm just asking for a mate. <laughs> well, I don't know what the, long, the secret to it is, but what I do know is that you've got to continue to work hard. It doesn't come any easier because the game changes all the time, so you've still got to be relevant and up to date with the trends that are happening in games, but... I think, like all of us, we've got a connection to the game. We love the game, first and foremost. And then one of the things that you try and do is stay connected in some way, shape or form. And for me, now that I'm not a part of a footy team anymore, I feel connected through the media. So that is my vehicle to stay relevant, but it's also a good way for me to think I'm still involved. You still love the game? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I love the game. Very passionate about it. Um, I like all sports. So I'm a guy that will watch all sports. Uh, obviously, rugby league being the number one. I grew up playing rugby league. Uh, I grew up playing AFL, obviously cricket in the summer. But rugby league was my passion. That's what I wanted to do. Um, you know, you never ever thought growing up in the bush that you'd get an opportunity to go and play in the NRL. Um, but, yeah, no, very passionate about rugby league and very passionate about the game um, and love watching it. My family love it and it's given me a great deal in life. Yeah, well, likewise. Um, with the – obviously you, heard, you talk about um, <clears throat> you enjoy other sports. Um, that, that's kind of one of the job descriptions though as well, isn't it, with the, the work that you do on the – the big sports breakfast, right? So um, how much do, do you need to be across and how much do you – well, sorry, yeah, I'll just go. How, yeah. much do you need to, how much do you need to be across? Yeah, I, see, for me, I like all sports. I've always loved all sports. Is there anything fact, that you – like you got um, – is there anything where it feels like work to well, watch? Well, there are sports that I don't know a lot about. And since I've been working on the big sports breakfast, they're sports that you have to try and keep up to speed with. But I suppose in Sydney, where we predominantly call, uh, well, you know, our, our, our viewers and our viewers, listeners are there, um, they love their rugby league. So while we try and talk other sports, it's predominantly rugby league. But given that I played cricket as a kid and loved cricket, um, loved AFL, uh, followed rugby union. They're our sort of major codes here in, in Australia. So when I find myself talking about those codes, I feel confident to give an opinion. When I'm talking about some other sports, I'm not as confident, but I'm able to know enough about those sports to sort of get my way through it. Yeah, and, and draw off your experience from, you know, top, top level, elite sportsman and elite coach in you know not exactly the same but mm. very similar like all sports are very similar with in terms of you know player behavior player performance yeah you know the, there's some familiarities there that do cross over oh most definitely i think that's one of the things you draw on uh, when you're a commentator you, you put yourself in that position whether it be a player as a coach you look at the circumstances that a player 
um, is, is, is facing or the challenges that a coach is, is presented with and you try and put yourself in that situation and you try and sort of work out what process you would go through um, and how you would either deliver the messages um, or how you would cope with certain situations. And I think as a player, um, you've been through it all. And as a coach, there's not many things that you come across that you haven't sort of heard or dealt with before. So I think that holds us in good stead when you're commentating on it. Well, one of the things you said recently was, um, you, I don't know if it's your love for AFL, but you certainly think that it's um, the number one sport in Australia. Is that is that correct or am I sort of paraphrasing a little yeah, bit there? Yeah, no, I, I think um, what I said was if you asked a lot of people here in Australia about the support of the code, um, a lot of people would say AFL. Um, and I base that on, you know, the amount of people all around Australia, um, you know, given that it's played in all, all our states um, and it has got a massive following. They've got huge numbers that continue to turn up um, uh, during the games and, and on the weekends to, to watch football. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think it's the number one sport. I'm just giving from a perspective of people turning up, watching it, people that watch it on television. Um, I think that rugby league, we still aspire to be the best and I think we are the best, um, but a lot of people disagree with me. And I just think with AFL, while it is a national sport, uh, rugby league is certainly getting closer and closer in terms of having people now looking at our game in a different light and seeing how exciting it can be, how tough it can be, how challenging it can be. Um, and this is coming from, you know, people in WA, people in South Australia, people in Victoria, given the Melbourne Storm have had success over a number of number of years and number of decades now. So I think, you know, rugby league is, is certainly up there, but AFL, um, with the amount of people that watch and support it, I think they're probably just in front of us where we we where we want to be. Yeah, I, I guess you know when you make comments like that, and you've explained it to me, and I um, tend to agree. Mm. But do you think it can? Are, are you aware of the, the position that you're in that you say something like that it can get taken out of context? Oh, uh, it can be manipulated. Yeah. Like League Legend says, AFL is you know that, <laughs> yeah. that's how it can be spun, right? Yeah. And, well, I think we all work, work in the media. Yeah. We all know how things uh, can, um, yeah, you know, unravel. Uh, you know, I, I read in the paper today that. And the headline was um, Craig Bellamy bows to pressure to select Justin Ollum. But then when you read the story, <laughs> the story's about Xavier Coates being out injured and young Tonema Pia being out injured. Well, I had to bring two people in. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he's not bowing to pressure. Yeah. It's just yeah. the fact that he's had to make change. So, so I understand how everything works. Um, and I think what people tend to do is just hear what they want to hear from what you say. Um, and, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I, I think when they actually sit down and can clearly understand or you clearly can articulate what you want to say, then they have a better understanding. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah, and, and obviously you, you said that, um, or you said what you said, um, and then – it, it ends up being taken by a good friend of mine, Gordon Tallis, and there was a bit of a bit of back and forth there. Was it? Were, were you expecting <laughs> that, or? Oh, Gordon and I are very, very good friends, um, and I'd expect nothing different from the raging bull. <laughs> he was one guy that I never went near on a football field, and love guy, uh, one guy that I love playing with. Um, but yeah, f for me. No, Gordy is just there. He, he loves and is passionate about the game as we, we all are. So uh, we, we, we knew it was coming. We had a bit of a discussion about it and obviously, we, you know, we had difference of opinion but I think Gordy understood where I was coming from so there was there's never any drama. Yeah, so a good, healthy debate. Yeah. Um, I think that's important and, and, and a respectful yeah. one. I think uh, you that. just uh, hit the nail on top yeah. of the head, Jimmy. I think 
everyone can have different opinions, but you've certainly got to respect each other. And I think, um, you know, in a world that we live in today, we, we don't see enough of it. You know, we don't see enough of people giving others the respect that they deserve. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person if you just don't agree with someone. It's just your opinion and you're entitled to say what you you think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, you, your opinion comes from a place um, that's gathered information, speaking to different people. and um, it, There's no necessarily right or wrong answer. It's just I I think X because of yeah. points one, two, and three, and you yeah. might think Y because of points five, six, and seven. Yeah, and, yeah. and, I, and I think yeah, that's 100% correct. I, I think that everyone has a different view on things, mm. and that's one thing I've always encouraged people to do is not just sit back and be a, a sheep and just follow everyone. Yeah, go know. along to get along. That's yeah, yeah. A, ba- a poor trait that yeah. people have. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah. No, yeah. no, no. If, if you've got an opinion, you should be able to voice that opinion. Mm. And have no concerns with voicing that opinion. And it doesn't mean you're right, wrong, but what, what you can be able to do is feel comfortable in the environment you're in and whoever you're talking to to share that and have respect. One of those um, other people that you, you have a, a shared space with, you have a difference of opinion with at times is is Michael Clark, obviously a, a legend, mm-hmm. and uh, in it, not in one of the football codes, but obviously uh, in cricket. Um, how do you find working with someone from a completely different sport when it comes to, you know, um, unpacking those issues mm. in the game like rugby league. So you're the expert. Yeah. He's from this other sport. And obviously the roles will be reversed as well when you're talking <laughs> about cricket and so is he. How, yeah. how do you find that aspect? Uh, at the start, it was quite um, intimidating is not the word. But you didn't quite feel as though you could voice your opinion on the game of cricket with authority because here he, here he is sitting there, the Australian captain, and he knows far more about the game than what I do. But over time when you build up a relationship and a rapport with someone, you can feel confident then to say what you really need to say or want to say. Uh, but at the start, if I was watching a game of cricket and I wasn't happy just as a viewer of the tactics that we were using, I, I felt uncomfortable to say that because I thought he'd just look at me and go, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not until you start to build a relationship and build a rapport with someone that you feel confident, obviously, to to express those uh, opinions. But And I'm assuming Michael would feel the same about rugby league, whereas, you know, he voices his opinion now about the game um, and he's earned the right to, to do that. Uh, but it is different at times when you're talking to a legend of another sport and another sport that you played, but you certainly weren't at that level yeah. that they were at. Or you as a fan <laughs> might have a feeling. Yeah. Like I know what it's like when I'm a, uh, an Everton fan. You know, m- my feelings are different to, you know, the people that are inside – you know, inside that football club yeah. and then also, you know, within inside the game of uh, football or, or soccer as yeah. it's known over here, like it, you just look at me like I've got two heads sometimes. <laughs> like, well, you don't get, you don't get it, mate. No, you're... well, that's what I love <laughs> about um, everyone being able to voice their opinion is because I can sit there watching a cricket game and I might not agree with the selections of players. And I could say, well, if I was picking my side, he wouldn't <laughs> be there. You know? yeah, or, yeah. or I'd bat him yeah, at yeah. three or, or six or mm. whatever the case may be. But that's the great thing about sport. Everyone's mm. got a different opinion. Um, but when guys like that, you're sitting next to them and they they explain it to you, what they're thinking and what they would do, you sit there nodding your head and going, yeah you're actually right. You've got a better understanding of it than me. Well, and also, and I say this all the time, like, and you'd be able to speak more about this, but when it, something like a selection, the people sit there at home and say, I would drop him, I'd pick him with uh, with full certainty. Like you can, yeah. they're very, you know, you can hear the um, conviction in their voice yeah. and they maybe they would, but they don't have the ingredients of pressure. No, and, and, and that's the other thing. And too. they don't see what's happening, you know, on the training ground. Yeah. Like five days a week. Yeah. And, and you, you, you'd you be able to speak to that where 
or they don't know the plan. Yeah. And perhaps these players are ex- the best, ex- be- the best players to go and execute the plan of the coach. Yeah. But that doesn't make for good TV. Doesn't make for good radio. <laughs> it's all pretty boring, that isn't it? It, it can be, and, and that's the challenge as a coach, isn't it? You know, you've got to be able to have a direction and a clear path that you want to go down, and then you've got to fit people into that system that you want to employ. Uh, there's no point having the 10 best halfbacks in your team if you want to play a powerful game through the middle. Um, so what you've got to identify is the people that will fit your system. And it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but you've got to back your decision and try and give them the best opportunities to succeed in the environment that you create. Um, and I think as a coach, that's what they always try and do. And we may sit there and disagree. And you've also got that allegiance to your club and you've got an allegiance to the the best player or the player that you support at that club. I, I can remember back in 1982, I was a Roosters supporter and Kevin Hastings missed out on the 82 Kangaroo Tour. And I'm like, how could he miss out? Like he was my favourite player. And I thought, I think he run, won the Rothmans medal that year as the player of the year. You know, but I, I, I couldn't believe that he missed out on the Australian side. And I was blowing up and this is a kid. So I understand all that and I understand how pe- people get passionate about their clubs and their teams. Um, and, and coaches, they're making best decisions for the team and the best decision on how to win. <laughs> they're not making best decisions on the personalities within the group because they're a good person and I don't like someone. That, that doesn't happen. It's about this guy here, he deserves to be in the team because I think I can win with him. And these are the reasons why I have him in the team because he does this well, that well, and it far outweighs the negatives. Yeah, well, it's always a point of conjecture, especially for New South Wales. Like, mm. you know, speaking today, 2023, you know, the embarrassment of riches of fullbacks yeah. that New South Wales have. Like, we can't, f- you can't fit them all in. And, you know, it may be even detrimental to the cause to have, okay, you might have to make a really tough decision on some of the the game's high-performing, informed players. Yeah. Because you can only really pick one fullback. Now, I know sometimes they can you know, transition to centre, um, play in other positions, maybe on the wing, but is that for the... Like, how much of a specialist centre do you want versus having room for a Latrell Mitchell, yeah. Tommy... To you know, it's, it, it's a fine balancing act for, for a coach, especially at representative <laughs> yeah, level. Yeah, it is. And I think you made the point before, though. As a coach, it's when you're in the firing line and you have to make that decision. It's always good to throw up names and options, but then you've got to write it down and select that side. And that's when you weigh up the pros and cons of what you think is going to be best for the team and best to represent whether it's your club or whether it's your country or whether it's your state. And there's always, always going to be wonderful players that miss out. Um, And that's been the case since 1908. It's never been any different. You're always going to have someone that deserves to be there, but they just can't force their way in for whatever reason. It might be the fact that someone else has been there, he's been an incumbent, he's been the captain, or and, and he's playing well enough not to be dropped. But yet you might have someone that's playing that nine out of ten. But again, he mightn't suit the role that you want him to play in that team either. Mm. So there's a lot of things to consider. Yeah, another one is that you've got two top quality dummy halves. Mm. We can only pick one. Ah, put one on the bench. But my plan might not be to play two hookers. And both are 80-minute players at club land. And their effect on a football game. Yeah is minimal. They need 80 minutes to get a feel from the game. So you've got to pick one over the other. Yeah. And it, look, part of the media now, and I I get it, but also sometimes I have to not lose track of the fact that these are difficult decisions for for, for coaches to make. And also even the fact it's it's about having belief in in knowing that you've made the right decision. Like, and, yeah, you know, I've been part of teams where players have missed out, but 
how the coach delivers that message and what the group's reaction to it is yeah. is vitally important that how they respond to media it, it's all part of it because it does all affect you know and if you know if you've got the group thinking well really if we had that player in yeah yeah i, I think um i think if you've got a good strong group of um leaders it's, it's like anything if, if you're dropped it, it shouldn't come as a surprise because as a coach or a leader, you're always taking players on the, on a path with you and you're always looking to grow them and you're look, always looking to improve them and you're always giving them feedback. So if, if you're giving them feedback along the way and they're not delivering what you need, well, you've reminded them a couple of times. So eventually you get to the stage where you make that decision. Now, if you make that decision – it shouldn't come as any shock. I like that saying, this shouldn't come as a surprise. It, it shouldn't come as a shock because you should be taken along, explained, and then when it happens, you sort of know it's coming. I think the one that always hurts is the one when it's just a surprise out of the blue. Um, or perhaps there's been a not enough feedback to that player. So things have crept into the athlete's game. Yeah. Bad habits, yeah. mistakes, yeah. and it's it's not mentioned. Yeah. And I, I think that all goes back to the yeah, when, when you go to an organisation, when you go to a club or walk into an environment, there's things that are just non-negotiable. And there's things that are explained very clearly 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 to players that this is what we're looking for. So you're going to tick that box first and foremost. Then once you've ticked that, then the other principles may apply. You know, then we'll look at the skill and we'll look at, um, you know, what you do under pressure, um, how you handle yourself under pressure, how you conduct yourself away from football. Um, but there's little things that you demand from your players and you know what, it's, pro it's got nothing to do with skill. It's about attitude and it's about what you're prepared to do over and above for your mate or over and above for your team and that's a good starting point. Then the skill comes into it and then what type of personality or, or teammate, I should say, you are. You know, because everyone should feel comfortable they can be themselves and one thing you try and encourage is everyone to bring themselves, not, you know, follow this path because that's the path that I want you to follow. Go down your own path and be who you are but there's some things that if you want to be yourself that you just still have to adhere to. Yeah. And I think that's that's just important as a, as a coach or a leader to set the plan. People know what's required of them so they don't have any doubt about the things that they have to get right if they want to progress further. Well, it's important as well that the – the coach acts on that uh, and doesn't let one or two areas of non-negotiables mm. be passed by by an individual because they bring other things to the organisation. Mm. It's a it's a very fine balancing act because I think we we see that I've witnessed that in teams that I've played before where okay, take something like kick pressure. Mm. It's everybody's job, but then we see people not take that on board when they're when they're, when they're in a position to do that mm. and then perhaps not be removed from the field play mm. say if you're playing in the middle mm. so their minutes would still be extended mm. but it's okay ha hang on you missed a non-negotiable i thought mm. i thought that was you know and then that but oh but then they the coach may argue that look it's for the we need that person out there for you know the, the, they're out of field. Yeah. They're big carries. Yeah. They're big moments. Yeah. Okay, well, you need to communicate that to us, yeah. and then we'll have that level of understanding. Yeah, you, you know, communication of the the non negotiables, who that applies to, yeah. why that person may not. Yeah. Be. <clears throat> I was part of a team when I don't know if you'd ever recall him, big Paul Anderson, huge front row, massive yeah. guy. The rule is three man tackles, legs go, except for him. <laughs> and we all knew. Yep. And because he didn't need to be ripping back on side, leave that to the young whippersnapper to get back. Yep. 
you know, he was, he'd go in legs and go, back you go, lad. I'd be like, jeez, <laughs> thanks, Blue. I'll bust my ass for you. Don't. But it came for the greater good of the team. Yeah. Um, also, mate, just picking up on what you said there, um, talking about people being themselves. Um, I've had that conversation with a couple of friends who are now, um, you know, Jeremy Lattimore. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Say so like, oh, just, you know, normally how people say, be yourself. Yeah. Don't. Don't be yourself, Jeremy. Be someone else because if you're yourself, you, you're not going to get this as a mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm am joking. There's a, there's a couple of others as well. Like that, I reckon that's a great line. Yeah. You know, to wind up a mate, it's like hey, you know, as people say like yeah, if you're going for a yourself. job, you know, people say be yourself. Oh. Don't. <laughs> well, it, I, I just found that the more different characters you have in a footy team, the better mix it is. And the more enjoyable it is, and you know, we talk about those um, non-negotiables. We used to call them NTRs, so they were no talent required. Yeah, that's what it was based on. It was just when they kick the ball, we want to be back in position on tackle two. That's our game. Now we, we all can't get back there, but I want the majority of people back there on tackle two. You know, and if we're getting back behind the ball quickly. We're going to give ourselves a better chance if we see space on the edge to move it, kick pressure, kick chase. So little mm. things that just uh, – it doesn't require talent. It just yeah. requires effort and they're things that you have to bring to a game. And then if you've got personality, you want a cheeky little bugger in your mm. team. You, you want someone that, you know, is, is good value, you, you, you know, and, and a bit chirpy. It, it's funny. Yeah. That it, it always fascinates me, team dynamics. It's, I just find it so fascinating because it isn't necessarily the the best players that make the best team. No. No, it's like the best player is not necessarily the best leader. Yeah. You know, your, your, your best leader are the guys that can play or train and bring others with them. You know, mm. and people want to support and follow them. You know, there's, there's players that you you play with or you see that, yeah, players respect, but they're just not going to follow them. They're just not leaders. Or they don't want to be leader. Yeah. Which, you know, yeah, it's which not is, for everyone. No, which is, it is which not is fair for everyone. No. And, and even that fascinates me even more where you've got this, you know, clearly young, talented, mm. amazing athlete. Yeah. But do you give them a leadership role if it's not comfortable for yeah. them? Well, I think with, with leadership, you need to support and help and show them possibly what leadership looks like. And, and again, if, if they opt out of that, that that's, that's cool. But one thing you need to be able to do in a team environment is to not, not convince people, but to make people realise that if you want to have success in a professional footy side, then everyone needs to do their job properly. And everyone needs to do their role and fulfil their commitment to the team. And if we have one or two players that are not doing that and taking shortcuts, well, we're never going to get to where we want to go. And therefore, you're holding me back from wanting to achieve a dream. You know, and you're holding yourself back from wanting to achieve a dream. So you've got to get the team to balance and the dynamic right. And you've got to pick players that have, you know, oh, you, you talk about skill, but you, you've got to have the, the, the player that's got desire and he's got passion and he's got want and he's never going to give up. He's just going to be there at the end of the day and you trust him with your life to compete as hard as anyone you've ever had in your team. Mm. And, and, and if you've got a lot of those players and they hold other people to account, I think you're heading in the right direction. And, you know, any footy side that I played in, you always got to spray if you didn't do the right thing, whether <laughs> it by the coach, whether it by yeah. a player, whether it, whoever. You, they'd always hold you to account. And I think all the successful teams have that because at the end of the day, you're all about winning a comp or winning an Origin Series or winning for Australia or, or Great Britain or whatever it is or England. Mate, if you've got people that just don't want to put in the same effort, well, you just can't you can't take them with you because it's too hard. And in today's environment, it's even harder. So you've got to bring the ones that you need and know that will help support you. 
Mm. Well, it's clear speaking to you, Laurie, that you um, you know what you're talking about. Um, it segues nicely into the sort of next area of conversation. Um, you have the big sports breakfast, but it's clear you know what you're talking about in a football sense in a form of coaching role. Um, is there room for that in your life right now? Um, no. I, I, as, a, as a head coach, there's too much responsibility. Mm. There's too much work for where I am at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, I loved being a part of the Indigenous All-Stars. I loved being a part of New South Wales Origin um, and thoroughly enjoyed it and didn't have the success, obviously, that we wanted to have. But working with, you know, motivated people gets you going. You know, when you're, when you're rocking to camp and you've got a good group of people with you, um, it, it's, it's, it's very satisfying. Um, and now that I'm in the media at, at my age, I'm pretty sure that if I left the media and went into coaching and coaching was there but I weren't, wasn't successful and then you went tried to get back into the media, at my age I doubt whether you would be yeah, someone but, that they'd look look at. So but, where I am at my s stage in life now is possibly coaching <laughs> no but, longer on the radar. Yeah, but there was a role yeah. there at Manly that was offered. Yeah. But it was you weren't able. Yeah, to, I've to been take offered a on. number of couple of uh, a number of roles over the last couple of years. But because I work with Sky Sports and it's owned by the TAB, um, I wasn't allowed to go and do a specialist role. What, what, um, what's the rationale for that? Um, like what's the explanation? Like when you, I, I don't know, lodge a contract, who yeah. do you speak to and what's, what's the, yeah. yeah. Well, it's all to do with the integrity of betting. And I think they believe that if you're involved in a betting company and you just can't be involved in a, in a club setup as a, as a coach. Um, which is fine because they've got to have their, their rules. I was disappointed uh, because I've had to um, knock back what, a couple what, of opportunities. What integrity do they question? What what do they think? Um, where's where's this got the potential to go wrong? Because I fail to, yeah. to understand. Well, you're a bit like me, Jimmy. I, I'm a very simple man and I, well, I can't <laughs> I, 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 I can't understand either. But... Um, the link between gambling and then either being a part of a coaching setup, I suppose it's all about um, using that information to pass on if someone is playing or not playing. I, I, I'm, I'm led to believe that's one of the reasons. But you know what's fascinating though? Like I speak and, to, and that's, that's, that's okay. But I speak to people rules. in the gambling industry and – they they close that down in a heartbeat because mm. they've got all the algorithms in play yeah. to know to 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 basically they're they're in play to safeguard them against suspicious gambling patterns. Yeah. So there's patterns and there's you know x amount of dollars to be spent on each and every market. Yeah. Each and every, so as soon as that goes, uh, you know, so, well as soon as a flag is raised, i.e., there's something suspicious going yeah. on. The market gets shut down. Yeah, 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 and and and, and you would and be you're right. and <laughs> you would be found out. <laughs> well, yeah, you would, you you would. So you'd lose your job anyway, yeah. and yeah. well, you'd probably lose both of your yeah. jobs. But you'd lose your credibility also. Well, and, you'd lose everything. You'd lose everything. So so what? So yeah. obviously, what what's the writ like? The I guess that the the incentive would to be make a couple of dollars, but you wouldn't be able to. No. No, well, no. I, I mean, I, you're not going to you're not going to clean up <laughs> off knowing who's playing. No, because as you quite rightly mentioned, mate, um, when there's a uh, an opportunity um, with that type of thing, it's everyone sort of knows about it pretty quickly, and things are shut down. Um, but again, you know, with with with, with coaching, um, I just enjoy the team aspect of it, and I enjoy working with individuals. But that's not to be. Um, so I've had to sort of stay out of it for a number of years. Um, but who knows? They, they may change the rules. Do you think they will? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but Are you part of the conversations with anybody 
Uh, is, is this a, a an NRL or is this government? Like no, no, or, no, or, no, no. It's it's the integrity, the unit. integrity yeah. unit of the NRL. Of the NRL. Yeah. Right. So so again, you know, I, I I understand where they where they're coming from, but it, but for me personally, I'd like to think that if I was involved in a a club, I, I'm not going to go down that path. But they're probably safeguarding themselves in case something did go wrong and then they would be accused of allowing this person who's creating an a, environment a, a gambling uh, yeah, organization was, so so yeah. I, yeah so i understand it um while you're disappointed you can't go and work with clubs but i but i um yeah it's it's just one of those things that you've sort of deal with and and sort of move on does it frustrate you to see others um be allowed to do it so i know that there's a couple of um well, I think it's Benji Marshall has a. It was reported in the Telegraph yeah. uh, a couple of weeks ago about a brand ambassador for Tab Harness Racing. Yeah, he's going to be the head coach yeah, of the see, time. See, I, I'm, like, I'm cool with that. I, I think that's amazing that you can be involved with another sport as an ambassador. I, I think people use rugby league players as an avenue to their sport and vice versa. Um, and if they're, you know, being an ambassador for horse racing, I, I can't see an issue with that. I, I, th I think it's sort of a cross promotion between right. the two two sports. Hang on, I've just had a thought. What what difference does it make if you if you work for a gambling company yet you are in a position as a coach? I mean, if you're a coach, yeah, you can still pass on information. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So well, you're always let's, talking let's, to different people. Yeah. You're talking to other coaches, you're talking to players, you're talking but, to... But what, what does it matter if you're affiliated with a wagering partner? Because oh. it's not going to change <laughs> anything. <laughs> no. Well, you're probably talking to the wrong bloke, Jimmy. Do you, know, do you yeah. understand? Because oh, I, I, I was, I was yeah. just talking to you then, I was like, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> it doesn't make, any, doesn't make any odds because you, you can... If you're in... The coach, you've got information at any level. Let's let's take um, any current NRL mm. head coach or assistant coach or part of the backroom staff. They're going to be privy to information. Yep. What difference does it make yeah. if they're aligned with a wagering partner? Yeah, I, I, zero. I, yeah, it's well, not going to affect them. It's not going to affect. In fact, it probably de incentivise you. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I. I, it's mind-boggling. It really doesn't make know. sense. It actually doesn't make any sense. Yeah. At the, to me, maybe someone smarter yeah. than I am could explain about why. And I mean, it, it's not going to stop anything. I, I wouldn't have thought so. I wouldn't have thought it's so. It's not going to change. It's not going to change any outcome. Yeah. No. But, I, yeah, I, I, I don't see an issue, but I understand they have a role to play the integrity unit. And they believe by you being associated with the company, if something does go wrong, um, people would be then asking questions, well, why didn't you stop this at that particular point in time? <laughs> I can't be like, well, stop what? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, <laughs> don't want to see the gambling, <laughs> the wagering partner. I, I work for get rinsed. Mm. That's the last thing you want. Mm. Yeah, no, well, that's exactly right. So. so so one of the roles was that you, you you've been um approached about is what was it was it manly? Yeah. Um what 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 was that again? Sorry. Uh it well it was a a bit of everything actually. It was it sort of a pathways program, um, and also to do um some specialized halves coaching. Uh, which would have been quite exciting, actually, because, um, you know, you've got a guy there, look, Daly Cherry Evans is one of the elite players of the competition, young Josh Schuster, who, you know, cops a lot, uh, but there's no denying his talent. Um, and being a former 5'8", you obviously think that you can uh, transfer some of the knowledge that you have into someone else's game. Um, but even um, just chats about life in general, I, th I think that's important too to be able to gain trust of people by talking about 
you as a person, them as a person, and try and forming strong relationships and connections. I think any any coach or any player, and again, you get back to the sides that I've been a part of and the sides that had success, all had a strong connection to each other. And if you haven't got that and you're disconnected, um, I, I just don't feel as though you've, you're going to have the success that you're after. But to your point with Manly, yeah, it was a all-encompassing sort of role. Um, but I was excited because uh, it was an opportunity to get back and sort of get on the ground and sort of start to talk and teach and sort of hope, hope well, would have loved to have helped progress someone's career. Would you consider um, letting go of of your role um, with the wagering partner to to go back into something like that? No, no. I, I really enjoy the role I've got now. Mm. I, I don't enjoy getting up at 4 a.m. <laughs> that's, that's that's tough. Um, I spoke to Mark Gary about that. He says waking up in the morning at yeah, 20 to 4, yeah, 4 yeah. o'clock. But you it, never but get used to it. It's good once it, you start and when you finish. <laughs> and then you get to the stage in the afternoon. If you sit, it's no good because you start to get tired. But it, it's a wonderful job. It, it's a it's a job that I love. You, you're, talking, yeah, you're just talking yeah. sport. You it, know? It's fun. Oh, mate. And I say to the people that I work with, Clark and, and Jared, that we're going to have a bit of a laugh too. You know, while we, we're, while we're a sports show and we need to be serious at times, if I were going to get up early in the morning and come in here, I want it to be a bit of fun. I want it to be a bit of fun, show your personality and – you know, what we spoke about before, you've got to be yourself. It's a good attitude to have that, to have fun. Oh, that way. oh. Espe- Especially, you know, it's far from ideal instead of time, but, you know, you... Oh. Well, one of the things I love doing, I, I love hanging with younger people because I feel as though when I'm with younger people, it makes me feel younger. Um, and I certainly don't want to, you know, grow old, grow angry <laughs> and... And, and not have fun, you know, because there's a long life hopefully still to live. And I think if you're energetic and you're around people that like having a bit of fun and they've got a bit of energy about them, you'll have that. And I think it rubs off on everyone. Great mindset to have. Mm. Yeah. Great mindset to have. Um, mindset plays a big big role in, in, in people's lives and it shouldn't be underestimated, the effect – that that attitude and mindset can have um, oh, for an individual to 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 approach life with yeah. it's it's vital. I actually did a little, little bit of reading yeah. and listening about people talking about that yeah. that very subject. It's um, yeah. Well, I think it's a lot to do with mind. I, th- I think if you think that that you're you know your age or you're old and you start to act old, <laughs> you'll become old very quickly. But if, if you want to get around and be active and, um, you know, do things like even what you were doing 10 years ago, I, I still think that's good. I, I still think that's a good mindset to have. And your mind, as you would very well know, it's a powerful tool, which we don't use enough of. No. We, we don't use enough of our mind. And I know coaches are starting to get into it a lot more than what we ever did. But I still don't think it's reached its full potential yet. I no think mind yet. coaches are so important to any team, any group. Um, and, you know, you just think about, you know, different situations that would involve you using your mind and how much strength you would gain if you just believed that you were going to do something. So it, 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 it's just amazing how, how much energy and how st- strong your mind can be if you were placed in a situation that you needed to be strong and you told yourself you're going to be strong, you will be strong. Absolutely. <laughs> M- mindset and um, barriers that have been put, put up um, that you get told about that you can't break through. Mm. Um, so it's the old folklore tale of, there was a, an extreme running race. I think it was here in Australia, actually. And um, it's, you know, you know, ridiculous sort of seven-day race. Yeah. And the, I, oh, the, I, the fact that I can't recall the, the man's name is, is really pissing me off. But he basically set off on day one 
goes trudging along and these sort of elite runners are like, hey, get onto all mate here. <laughs> he smashes the record. Because no one told him that you're supposed to stop and sleep. Yeah. Yep. Well, so he didn't have a mindset of like, you know, oh, we yeah. get to point B, yeah. that's where we rest. Yeah. And, you know, we go again. That's what they all did. Yeah. Uh, he just cracked on. Just, just, And, and that's what you And he it. stopped sporadically. Yeah. But he didn't have that set, that mindset no. of, well, I get here and then I rest yeah. and then I go again. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this might be one of those old wives' tales of well, folklore, no, but it's... Well, 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 it wouldn't be, Jimmy, because if I said to you, if you did no running at all, all right, and I said to you, I need you to run from, I don't know, Sydney to Perth. Sydney to Perth. And even if you had never run before, and I said to you, but if you don't get there, I'm going to take your children away. Yeah, I'm going. You're not giving up, are you? No, I'm going. <laughs> you just mm. battle away. You mm. get there. And because mm. you've set yourself mm. that target that they mean a lot to me mm. and I don't care what other mindset yeah, I've going. got, your mindset changes straight away. Mm. But if that wasn't there, mm. you go, uh, oh, geez, I don't know whether I can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, if you've got that end goal and you believe you want to get there and do it, you will. Mm. It, it's funny even that where I – I had a big hip surgery uh, when I finished playing in 2021. Started to run again and it always gets uh, – I was, I was training for a half marathon and I'm not sure if you've trained for one before, but um, – Bad news here, mate. W w once a week, the sort of – the uh, the long run goes Ooh. up by one or two kilometres. Now, it started at, say, five, then we, you know, yeah. progressed to – I think we run 16 maybe before the, yeah. that would be the, the maximum we get to. Yeah. So the, the train blocks go out and on the last K of the long run, that's when my hip started to play up. Yeah. Because I'm, it was a finished mindset. I knew I was close to the end. Yeah. And that's when it started to go. And how we approach finish lines is another thing about mindset. But my, my mind, body just knew, okay, we're close to the end now. We're just going to tighten up and let you know. Uh, yeah. It was bizarre, <laughs> and then I do the the, the follow on one at seven, yeah. about six, go next right. week, and obviously there's there's training patterns and loading yeah. patterns and familiarity in there. But it always seems, and even now I still run a bit, no matter if I go five, ten, fifteen, whatever. It's always the last K. Yeah, I start to feel it in the hip. <laughs> it's bizarre. Um, well, mate, you were talking there before, so my knees are buggered. But if I had to run twenty K, I would, mm. no matter how. Buggered my knee is, I'd get to the end. Yeah. You just it depends on the the, the, the incentive, incentive, the pr mate, the mind. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I just think that we can use it so much more mm. and we neglect it, but it's still one of the strongest things you can possibly have, a good mindset, strong mindset. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the keys to longevity as well. Um, speaking of mindset, take us back to the young boy in the bush. Ooh. Um. Well, I grew up, I was one of eight, so I got seven sisters. So I grew up um, in Juneau playing all types of sport. Um, played backyard, played on the road, <laughs> played everywhere. As long as you get numbers, away you went. And even <laughs> if you only had another person, you'd play one-on-one. -on one-on-one. -one. Um, and, yeah, just, just loved it. Uh, never ever dreaming or thinking that you would have an opportunity to go and play for an NRL team. And sport just consumed my life, you know. I used to watch it on telly. You know, you'd watch the ABC match of the round. You, you know, you'd, be, you'd go and play on a Saturday. You'd rush home. You'd watch the, watch the footy and half time you'd go outside and kick the footy around and you'd be back in after the game. So... Yeah, no, a football was just a love. It was a passion. I, my, yeah, my mother used to tell me I used to sl go to uh, bed with a footy in my hand. She reckons if it rained the night before, she, she reckons I'd be up all night wondering whether the game was going to be on or whether it would be Your canceled. game? Yeah. Because, well, yeah, when, when the oh, rain came, yeah. they just used to cancel. Um, so she reckons I was that disappointed if I ever cancelled a game. And um, Yeah, so I, I, was, I was just like most... Kids from the bush. That I'm just laughing, but I'm smiling. 
You know, it's like funny to think of that kid. <laughs> yeah. That would be like kicking stones because it's oh. where my game's off. Oh, mate, my game's off, yeah. And one of the biggest punishments ever got. So I can't remember what I did wrong. I can't remember what it was. It might have been 14 or 15. And my dad said to me, right, you're not playing. You're not playing footy this weekend. Oh, I was just trying to think what it was. Anyway, whatever it was. I might have had to chop the wood, I think it was. I think it was chopping the wood and I failed to do it. And he Is goes, not you're playing? not playing. And mum tried to beg him to let me play because I was crying and carrying on. No, wouldn't let me play. Coach came up, no, not playing. And that was one of the biggest lessons I ever learnt. So the wood was always Yeah, there. I was going to say, you chopped the wood <laughs> yeah. next. So, you start chopping it Monday. <laughs> so I, I used to chop the wood, yeah, so it was done. <laughs> that's a, that's just a great bit of insight. That you you start to come through um, at the Raiders and still a teenager, and you get thrown into this star-studded team and winning premierships almost instantly. What what are your recollection recollections Ooh. rather from that time? Um, like bearing in mind you've come from remote area. You're not thinking that this is going to – Yeah. The, the, the end game isn't to play NRL. You're just loving every moment. It's – Well, you just turn up expecting just to play footy. So I was um, playing Jersey Fleet. And in those days there used to be three grades. So there's 23s, reserve grade, first grade. So I played Jersey Fleet on the Saturday, but because I was classed as a contracted player every Tuesday night, They'd train as a club. So I used to turn up there. So I, I knew hardly anyone. So I'd rock up to training, playing juniors on the Saturday, and then just rock up and sort of just train and go home. So, because I, I didn't know too many people. And then one particular day, Wayne Bennett came to me and he said, uh, How do you think you went on the weekend? And I'd scored a few tries. And I went, oh, yeah, I went okay. I said, but I've got a bit of improvement left in me. And he looked at me and he said, uh, if that's the best you got, we're in some trouble. And just turned his back and walked away from me. And I thought, oh, geez, this bloke doesn't like me. And yet a couple of weeks later, it might have been, you know, four weeks or whatever it was, I was selected to go and play first grade. So I sort of... Came through, I played half a game, I think, in under-23s or, and then went and played um, first grade. So I think it was just sort of a warning shot for Wayne that he thought he had a talented kid, probably making sure he never got too far in front of himself. He was, was he testing you? Possibly, <laughs> yeah. Possibly. Yeah, I think he was, yeah, because he's pretty hard. Um, you didn't know really where you stood with Wayne. And I think he was one of the reasons why they turned the Raiders around, you know. The, the Raiders in a competition in 82, so this is 87, and he gave them a real backbone. And you talk about um, a DNA of a club, he was all about just competing. You know, that was a Wayne Bennett coach team, just competing. And if you didn't, if you were doing a 100-metre sprint and you pulled up two metres from the line, then you were going again. Little things like that, you know. Had to get back, touch the line. If you didn't touch the line, <laughs> go again and just kept drilling at India, you know. So those little things I, I learned along the way. Um, but, yeah, that was one of the, the the first experiences. And then, you know, looking at a bloke like Mal Meninga, who the previous three or four months, I was waking up in the middle of the night to watch the Kangaroo Tour in 86. Um, and then, yeah training on the same field as him and you're going, well, how good's this, you know? Um, he doesn't know who I am, but I definitely know who he is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so so that it was quite weird to be to be perfectly honest because I was quite uh, shy, quite – and very young. I was only 17. So you just sort of do what you had to do and get out of there. Yeah, it is. That's a good way of looking at it, a weird experience, yeah. especially back then when the – you know, the pathway system was was a little bit different and you know, not different. quite rubbing shoulders with the superstars from such a young age. Yeah. It's who, who are you? 
Well, that's what it was like. It was like holding your path. Who, who's your, this bloke? Yeah. Like, what's he doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Just hold the path. <laughs> and and in those days, you you didn't speak to anyone unless you, they spoke to you. You, know, mm. you, you, you didn't have that that confidence um, and it was all about sort of earning respect. So you had to earn respect either through the way you trained or how you played Yeah, in that footy environment. How do you think that camera side would go up against um, the Penrith of today? Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's always difficult to judge different yeah. eras and, and different teams. I think you just judge it on in that period, if they were good, then they'd be good today. Yeah. I, th- I think that's the only way you can do it um, because, you know, you look at the Dragon side that won 11 in a row. You know, if you're judging it purely on 11 in a row, like they're the best of, of all time, you know. Well, a lot of the rules of our game were changed as well. Yeah. That's like a bit of a legacy, legacy. piece that yeah. perhaps gets overshadowed Shadowed. by the fact that like, okay, you've won 11 in a row. The people in charge of our game had to go in and go, we need to change something here yeah. because they've got some tactics um, Too good. and strategy <laughs> that is unbeatable. Yeah, and and I think, um, you know, I, I can remember the Roosters in 74, 75, around that period, just having a, a dominant footy team, you know, with Arthur Beetson um, leading, leading the way. Um, then... Parramatta in the eighties, mm. right? And the and the and the dogs, even though they didn't win as many many premierships, just in the early part of that eighties, like they were two amazing footy teams and two sort of completely different styles of styles of uh, footy teams, you know. But Parramatta with you know Sterling and Kenny and Price and Cronin, like that was a wonderful team, a wonderful team. I'd ru- I'd love to run a simulation and have all these great teams have all the modern day training methods and all come yeah. together and play each other. It'd be fascinating watching. But I guess we'll it's one of those that's for the Yeah. That's for the dream and the that, opinions and and, that, that. and that's exactly right, you know. I, I I remember sort of Bradley Clyde who I played with and and Clyde was a machine. So he he would just carry the ball like a front rower. And he was an edge back row before edge back rowers were there, but he'd always be there. Um, and if you needed him, if you were moving the ball, and you had a lot of width to move the ball, he'd be running like a centre. Like he was just a freak. Um, and I th- yeah, players like that would just be so good in any era. Timeless. Any era. Absolutely timeless. timeless. Yeah. Timeless. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think you'd you know probably put yourself in that category as well. Well, I think. Different eras, obviously, changes and 5.8s were doing different things to how I was playing and 5.8s still now do different different things. So I think you'd learn to adapt, but it's really hard. It's like when you get asked the best player you've ever played with because you know, I, I reckon if I asked, got asked that 20 times, I'd probably come up with four or five different people yeah. at different functions. <laughs> yeah. Like if everyone's – Yeah. Because yeah. you just – I don't know, there's just so many. Yeah, there's just so many and it's too difficult to sort of nominate one. Yeah. You know, or, or toughest, you know, all that type mm. of stuff. Oh, yeah. Because there's so many because there's nothing between some of the greats of our game. Mm. There's well, nothing between them. Lars, I'm going to be honest with you, mate. I, I was kind of hoping for the answer that you'd destroy the Penrith Panthers of today and, <laughs> uh, you know, really generate a headline, a big headline. <laughs> no, but I, I, I totally understand. It would be, it'd be fascinating to watch. So um, you start to make your name for yourself in, in this um, Raiders team and you're still just a, a boy, really, mm. when you're lifting premierships and you've, like, just how quick was that? I'm in the bush. Oh, well, to, to pre- like, what was so, it, two so or three I, years? I, well, I turned up in 1987 at, as a 17-year-old and by the end of the year I was sitting on the bench for the grand final. So I wow. still hadn't turned 18. Didn't get on in the grand final um, but just – and it was the last grand final at the SCG so I'm thinking, geez, how good is this? Like, um, so I was 
just just wrapped. And then 1988 came around and I trained hard and then got an opportunity um, and then took that opportunity and then was able to, to play and then sort of injured my shoulder, start of the year, popped out, kept on playing and then we made the semi-finals and uh, I think, just trying to think who knocked it, Balmain knocked us out. They went on that run and played the dogs in the finals. And we were probably disappointing that year because we had probably the best squad the Raiders had ever assembled, but we just couldn't get each um, person onto the field or into the squad at the same time. There was always one or two out injured and we bounced out. Um, we got beaten by the Bulldogs just and then Balmain uh, beat us and those two ended up playing the grand final with the doggies winning. But, yeah, that was disappointing, 88. And then 89, we were inconsistent to start the year. We, we were sort of up and down and, you know, there's plenty of chatter going on, what's going on with the Raiders. And then we just found our sweet spot towards the back end of the season and we had to keep winning games. And we were sort of – we were an inexperienced team but we weren't. <laughs> If that makes sense. Uh, you know, myself, uh, Bradley Clyde, uh, Ricky Stewart, uh, Glenn Lazarus, we were sort of young guys on the on the rise. Um, but we had, you know, guys like Mal Meninga, Gary Belcher. Um, Stevie Walters was still coming through as well. Um, hadn't played uh, rep footy. And then, you know, you had the, the old guys like Dean Lance and Gary Coyne. Um, and they were they were good teachers and good mentors as well, those guys. Um, and, and, and those guys, and you'd attest to this, that you know when you used to do the old players play, I don't, I don't even know whether they still do players player after the game. Those style of players used to always get players player. It wasn't the fancy guy who would get the three points in the Dally M. It was always those type of guys that would get the players player. The ones you appreciate. Yeah, yeah. The ones that inside that group know the work that they're doing, the little things that they're doing and the things that other people wouldn't do, they're doing it. Um, and to see them get knocked around they, how, they, how they would on the weekend but then Tuesday night turn up and train and they'd be limping and hobbling. And, but they, they wanted to get out there and do it. And I, I think that sort of mentality was so good to learn from. So I, I was lucky in that regard. And then, yeah, to, to win competitions for the Raiders was just fantastic. Well, rumour has it the you didn't just win the trophy. It was dropped. Or is that... Yeah. Is that... No, nah, that was... Is that, is that legend or is that... Well... Is there an, a grain of truth or has well, it been well, embellished? I, well, I, well, I didn't drop it. <laughs> All right? I didn't okay. drop it. So mm-hmm. I'll tell you what... The, the, the story was. So we actually, when you do, you, you celebrate long and um, proud and we went all through the night and then the next day we had to get a, uh, it was a street parade from Queanbeyan to Canberra and that's about, I don't know, 15 kilometres, something like that. It might even be a little bit more but um, anyway, we get into the, the cars and it's an open top car and for whatever reason, and I'm hammered, they give me the trophy. So I'm like, oh, right, I know, no worries. And I'm hammered it up as you're going through the streets. And there's thousands of people just lining the streets from Queanbeyan to, to um, Canberra. And I, I, I've got the trophy here. Must have been beer or whatever, you know, just drinking. And um, the guy who was driving, he goes to slow down. So as he goes to slow down, I sort of release my hand from the trophy and I go to take a swig of beer. And as I've gone like that, I felt the car accelerate. I could feel myself sort of going forward. And I thought about trying to grab the trophy, but it was quite heavy. And I knew if I went to grab the trophy, it would just take me back and I'd fall out of the car too. So I didn't want to look like a dickhead. So I just sort of let it go (laughs) and... (laughs) What had happened was it it smashed. So like how bad are we talking? Uh, well, the base was all smashed, and there was a couple of fractures to um, the legs of uh, Summons and Proven. Um, and it, the photos of 
the 89 premiership and there's one in particular of Mal holding it in the middle of Canberra in front of 30,000 people. And it's just the base is wrapped in a towel, <laughs> keeping it and holding it together. So I reckon people, when they look at that photo, they're going, what, what, what's the go with that, that towel there? But anyway, after that, I got into a bit of trouble, so I had to go down in front. Did you? Yeah, I did, yep. yep. For what? Oh, Mate, for you, were ju- you were just trying to – you saved yourself. So, that, saved been, that would have been <laughs> a far worse look. <laughs> so, yeah. Were they, were they buying the explanation? Yeah, they did. And who who who, so, yeah, who just Johnny explain? Quire. John Quire. So He's the leader of the game. Yeah, he was the leader of the game. Not yeah. so you're not having conversation no, with no, camera. No, this no, is like from, yeah, the went, top went to dog. The top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So anyway, so I had to have a discussion with him and I think he believed me, but he was sort of not impressed and basically said, Mate, you need to ship up here. Well, you can ship out. <laughs> ah. So, and again, I think, like anything, you, you need little warning shots along the way. Yeah. And keep reminding you that, hey, listen, if you want to get to where you want to get to, you've got to start doing the right thing. So, yeah, as much as um, I, I, I did the wrong thing. But you didn't really. But I didn't. No. Really. It's... That's what I thought. But anyway, that was that was what happened at that period and you sort of – I don't. I think you just accept it and move on. I, th- I think, like with anything, if people are honest and they're through the front door with you, I don't know. You just accept it and go. Yep, no worries. Not, yeah. not a problem. Did, did you get fined or any sort of no? Uh, I didn't get fined. Reaction? I did, just didn't get fined, but it was a just, uh, just uh, yeah. And and Quayley could just sort of deliver that news, and he wouldn't sort of smile. And you were going, oh, I don't know whether he likes me. Was he part of the? <laughs> Representative selection panel at that time. No, as well. he wasn't. No, he wasn't. But he was the uh, well. It used to be the NR, uh, the New South Wales Rugby League. But he was a fantastic administrator. Mm. He was a great fella and someone that really sort of took the game to another level. Him yeah. and Ken Arthurson. Yeah. Well, actually, speaking of that, um, you were hot property when the Super League War um, erupted. Yeah. Uh, do, doing it. For, for me, it, this all is, is fascinating. It wasn't here. Know a lot about it. No relationships are, are still fractured. Uh, but I was reading you a part of the, the court process yeah. uh, uh, as as well. We spoke with your former teammate Bradley Clyde about you know his conversations with Roosters. And it, it all seems, look, I guess looking back now, for me as an outsider, it's like fascinating this what exactly happened but what was your experiences through through that whole time period so my experience was um there was some talk on the 94 kangaroo tour about this new competition but i don't think anyone really thought it was going to get anywhere and then we were playing the cowboys and out of the blue out of the blue, we got told that there was going to be a meeting in Townsville when we got there. There were some big things happening. And we got up to Townsville and they said that we're staying at the Sugar Shaker. I don't know what they even call it. It might be the Travelodge. It might have been the, the Travelodge. And um, they told us about this new competition and they were signing people and there was going to be sort of raids happening that night. Who's telling you this? So this is coming from uh, the club. So um, would have been Kevin Neal at the time. Um, he's just saying that that uh, news want to speak to you guys about something exciting. Then it was meeting at the casino in Townsville, and then a uh, bloke by the name of David Smith sort of delivered the message on what was happening. So he basically said then that this is what's going on. We want to start up a new competition. Uh, we're looking at signing all these clubs. We're looking at p- d- signing players right here, right now, starting with you guys. Plus we've got people in other areas signing up players. So that's sort of how it went down. And then we had meetings and then it was about offering you a certain amount for a certain length of time um, and – Basically, that was it. It was a conversation on starting up a new competition. Do you want to be a part of it? The Raiders are going to be a part of it. And if you do, 
this is the financial arrangement that will come, will hopefully will come together with. Are we talking? We're talking significant increases in. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah player yeah, salaries, yeah, right? Yeah. You're, you're talking like jaw, jaw to the floor stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're you're, you're talking big, big money compared big to where you were. Yeah, at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like six, seven times, wow. eight times. And was there counter offers for you? Because you would have been one of the yeah the best players I'd in actually, the competition. No, at the time. I, I, once I'd made my decision, I was I was actually off contract. So oh it, yeah, yeah. So I, I I was off contract. So um, so at the end of ninety five. So and yeah, there's no rules or regulations. I don't think in place then where they are today, where you can't talk to a club before a certain date. You know. So at the end of '95, yeah, I was I was coming off contract. So you have contract. Not really? that it would have mattered, yeah. but I I I wanted to stay because the club was staying with Super League, and the majority of players were mm. going to stay. So we spoke about staying together, and once that sort of became quite clear that everyone wanted to stay, everyone wanted to be a part of the Raiders, um, then we just sort of done our deals. Yeah, so you didn't field. Any conversations or anything from from other clubs no, or the other? No, the other? not really. No, no, no. I, I, I didn't. Um, and to be tr- to be truthful, I, we just thought that it, everyone would um, everything had sorted itself out. Like there'd either be a compromise, and they would come back together, or Super League would would win out. That's the way the way we thought it at the time. But we genuinely thought that. The Two comps would come back together, yeah, rather than splitting. Yeah, which obviously they eventually did. But yeah, there was a lot of damage done. Well, oh, most definitely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why do you think there still is damage to this day? Like it's never been. Oh, I think um, like fully I, yeah, repaired, has yeah. it? Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think if you had your time over again. I, well, I, I know if I had my time over again, I, I'd do it a different way. I don't know whether it would be a different conclusion to what I came up with what, at the time. What do you mean by do it a different way? Well, I don't think we knew what damage was being done to the game. As a, as a as player. You, as, a, as a player. As a player, you don't realise yeah. that you know, how fans were becoming angry and how disruptive it was, you know, and hatred from both sides. It was sort of a lot more intense than what you ever – Ever dreamed of? Was it? And did the? Did you think the players were being like you know that? Oh, all you care about is the money. You ruined the oh, game. Oh yeah, most most definitely. But, yeah, but I think um, to to be fair too, I think um, at the end of the day, when anyone goes through a contract process, I think money is very important. And I don't care who you are. I mean, when you're doing your contract, otherwise it'd be easy just to go. Well, there you go, mate. Just sign. Well, for, for, I think it. it Money comes from fairness and being paid what you're worth as an individual and as a collective group yeah. as well, which we've obviously yeah. seen some of the trials and tribulations yeah. over the past, you know, mm. eighteen months with the CBA. Yeah. Like it's about and I, I it's important see, and, it, and it's about yeah. being paid what you think is fair and yeah. reasonable. Yeah, and and I don't see anything wrong with that if you say no. that it that's, happens in every industry. That, that that's what you're doing. Um, and for me, sitting in that room and being offered that deal it was life-changing for me so it, it was it was life-changing so I without thinking about the damage to the game it was more than it came down to players are staying clubs staying I'm going to be able to secure my future and look after myself and go to this new and, league and go to, yeah and then it wasn't until yeah a month later or a couple of weeks later or a week later whatever it was that the the fire started to to get bigger and bigger. So again, so back to your, your statement about saying you do. Th- what possibly could you have done differently? You think? Well, I think you would be um, asking a lot more questions. I, I, I think rather of, than of who? Oh, both sides about what the game is going to look like into the future. Why can't you work together? Um, what's this about? Because. Um, yeah, you know, pay television was happening at the time, um, so there was a lot of different angles that that people sort of were 
talking about without talking about. So just, just trying to understand a bit more, you know, if you knew what type of damage was going to be done to the game, people walked away from the game, um, teams were lost. Um, so you lost a lot of supporters. There was, you know, hatred. So, so that part of it I didn't like. But I didn't understand the impact it was going to have. Mm. And I think that's why if I had my choice, chance again or time again, you'd certainly ask a lot more questions than what we did at the time. It, it is that's, in, a, that's a an old a bloke putting benefit of but, hindsight yeah. because in the moment mm. you, you you'd be what mid twenties at the time you uh yeah it would have been t- 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 twenty it would have been twenty four or five yeah yeah it's Quite easy better, it's yeah. easy to say oh I I wouldn't do that or you know, you know put question motives and whatnot but at the end of the day you you've been offered these you were in you were in this situation through no fault of your own yeah like it was a situation the players and the clubs were thrust into the players specifically were thrust into a it's not like you went on this quest to find <laughs> no this situation no it was a situation that it was came just, to us it came to you yeah and then you've got to act and make a decision and people can look at those uh, that decision-making process and and the outcome of that decision, and say, well, I would have done that differently. It's like you, you've got no idea. Yeah. You're almost amb- you're almost yeah. by the sounds of from the outside looking in from a player's perspective, it's like you were ambushed by this mm. situation. Yeah, and you know, and, and I've got no um, hard feelings about um, you know, people being aggressive towards us um, at the time, um, because. Rugby league is very passionate and people are very attached to their teams, their players. Um, and and again, I, for me, I, I don't think I would have changed my decision, but you just would have done things a little bit differently as I explained. But, yeah, it was one of those situations there. Once the club, once the players agreed that they wanted to stay together, it was just a matter of just doing a deal. The, and the Canberra community, how was their sort of reaction? Can you recall? Uh, yeah, I think there would have been some people disappointed, obviously. Um, but I think a little majority of them wouldn't say didn't care, but I think they accepted it, that your team was still going to be a part of rugby league. You're still going to have your same sort of playing group. And at the end of the day, the supporters are attached to the club mm. you know players come and go yeah but the supporter he will always he will always mm. he or she will always be there yeah we're going to take a quick break from the podcast to tell you about ag1 the daily foundational nutritional drink with all your needs in the one place i like to look after my health and ag1 takes care of that for me no more tablets vitamin pills vitamin pills all the health nutrition I need, all in the one place. Every single morning, it's as easy. Open up the fridge, scoop of AG1 in a glass, cold water, stir it with a fork, drink it. It tastes great, and it helps me know. It gives me the peace of mind that all my nutritional needs are taken care of, all in the one drink. It really is as simple as that. And also, anybody that knows anything about health benefits, knows that it comes with adding simple routines to your day. It's not about magic pills. They're not going to work. AG1 helps me be the best version of myself by having this new habit of every single morning having that drink. I know my nutritional bases are covered thanks to AG1. A lot of athletes are now taking AG1 and with 75 high quality ingredients, it's no wonder why. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com forward slash buy round. That's drinkag1.com forward slash buy round check it out just throughout you, your career and said you were coming off contract did you ever get um an offer to move or did it ever um yeah yeah there was a couple of uh opportunities but the, the one that um i considered the most 
uh, was 1991. So the Raiders had been in three grand finals in a row and they had um, issues with their salary cap. So they were over the salary cap. So they had to cut a lot of players. Um, and because they were over the salary cap and everyone's contract had to be reworked, then um, everyone was a free agent basically. So then it was a matter of this is what the club can afford to pay you now. Um, you either accept that offer or you obviously can go and try and find yourself a deal with someone else. So I explored my options. I spoke to Wests at the time uh, and the Dragons. And they were the sort of two teams that if I was going to leave, um, I was going to go and play with. And I had a great association with Jeff Carr, who was the CEO at the Dragons at the time. And he was our manager in the Australian teams, State of Origin teams. Um, so I reckon if I was ever going to leave, it would have been the Dragons I would have, would have went to. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it was sort of – it was hard to leave. It's hard to leave because you knew that if you left, the group was splitting up even more. Yeah. And I – I wanted to sort of make sure because the Raiders have been so good to me and still are, you know, they're like family to me. So I wanted to make sure that I never left them in the lurch. It was a different thing, loyalty back then to what it is now. Probably it. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But it, it really, um, when, when push came to shove, I, I just found it difficult mm. I guess in to that situation that I was going to go and play somewhere yeah. else, it was like, oh, you know mm. what, I, I can't do it. Yeah, and like we said, like money's important, mm. financial um, compensation for the the service that you provide. To yeah. put it w one way, um, you're actually taking less. Yeah, most definitely. Like, and, and fundamentally, like, I'm take less to stay, which yeah. I think is what it should be for those sort of local homegrown yeah. players and in a way, but, I mean, to have that renegotiation. Yeah, and it uh, was sort of, um, you know, you'd won two grand finals mm. and you just came off the back of your third grand final in a row. We'd, you'd lost you, you'd lost nearly a full team. We lost nearly a full team. So you lost guys like Glenn Lazarus and Brent Todd. Um, our backup hooker was a guy by the name of Wayne Collins. Um, and he went to the drag and ended up playing in the grand finals, I think, in 92, 93. You know, guys like Nigel, Nigel Gaffey was there. David Barnhill was another one. So these are a lot of guys that were playing in and out of first grade that just had to, had to go because they couldn't afford to stay. Um, and then in 1992, our season was horrible because we didn't have a lot of depth and we got a few injuries and I, th I don't even think we made the finals. No, we didn't. We, we didn't even make the finals. So that was a bit of a um, bit of a shock to us because we thought we were we would still go okay. Um, and then one of the great coaching performances of all time in Tim Sh oh, Tim Sheens, he went across to um, a tournament which they call the Pacific Cup. And the Pacific Cup was where, you know, Fijians, um, Samara Tonga, the Maori, um, they all played in a, in, a, in a tournament. And we didn't have any money. The Raiders didn't have any money to recruit a lot of high-profile players. So we were sort of doing pre-season thinking, oh, geez, how are we going to go again this year, you know? We haven't really recruited anyone. So Tim comes back from this tournament and he goes, guys, I've got four guys that I think will go all right for us. And they were John Lomax... Quentin Pong here, uh, Noan Andruku, Ruben Wiki. <laughs> so <laughs> they, they all come into Jeez. the team. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't know any of them, never heard of them. How good's that? And then they started and in pre season you're going, oh, yeah, no, these guys are going okay. Noah um, came and then they got an opportunity at the start of that year and we went from not making the finals to having those guys in the team to be being, I think we were premiership favourites, us and the Broncos, and then Ricky Stewart broke his ankle, might have been a week or two weeks out from the semi-finals. Yeah. And uh, gone for the year. 
and we sort of finished second or third, I think, and we lost both our finals. But that was the quick turnaround. And then 94, we ended up winning it again. Yeah. It's amazing, though. So he was it? one of the but first to go over there and recruit a lot of Polynesian Yeah, that, that pathway production line is so important and it's interesting to see how we approach it because it's untapped. There's so much potential there. Yeah. Um, and it just needs the right people with uh, the correct number of resources and g giving the people the resources and we'll see the the, the numbers from out there um, start to increase, uh, but it's something that we need as a game as we look to expand and grow our competition. And that's the untapped talent pool, I think, that we could uh, yeah, oh. we could harness some talent from. You, you, you just know there's a lot more players out there that mm. would be so good in our game from those developing mm. nations. Mm. How'd they go in Canberra? Because I, I can remember... It's funny how like things. Well, Noah, Noah, Noah didn't like it because it was very cold. I was going to say, so I, <laughs> funny how things stick in your mind. I yeah. can remember watching um, a game, but NRL was very um, few and far between the games. I think a highlight show, mm. and I remember watching Leslie Vinicola who played at Canberra, and it was snowing down yeah. there, and like he was just with this look of amazement on this <laughs> highlight show. And then it, he'd come over and play for Bradford, which, again, so it obviously didn't put him off. But it would be interesting to see how those lads took to the, the colder conditions yeah. at Canberra. Because it, it can bring up a, a degree of toughness as well. It can... Yeah, it's, it's amazing, though. Once you're there for a while, you just it, you become accustomed to it. So it's just like if you dress for it, you're right. Mm. Um my dad used to say that. Yeah, There's no such thing as bad weather, son. No. Only, in, only inappropriate clothing. And that's exactly right. So if you dress for the weather, the occasion, mm. you, you, were, you were okay. But um, yeah, those guys, I think, obviously struggle when they first came across. In particular, um, no, I think the New Zealand boys were okay because it can get quite cool over there. But that game with Leslie Vanicola, that was my last year. And were, you, were you playing in that game? You know I, the one I, I'm talking I about? I played in that game, yeah. Leslie scored in the left corner um, in the, uh, the, the southeast, uh, yeah, southeast corner. Um, but that was the first and only time a game has been played in the snow in the NRL. Really? It's never snowed in Canberra during a game ever before so it was only the first and only time oh right so it's a it was a big deal for everybody mate i can remember someone saying um it's snowing outside and i went bullshit they said mate, no it's coming down and you were going outside and you're staring just going wow i've never seen this mm. it's my 14th year at the club and i've never played in any condition like this before ever in england i've never played in snow mate it's it's not fun. I can still, like, I've got a few moments in my career I can close my eyes and take myself there. Yeah. I can close my eyes, take myself yeah. to 2004. Um, can't remember the, the team we were playing, maybe London Broncos. I got put on my back, first tackle, in the cold. Yeah. I can still feel that chill now. So you know, like, yeah. oh, you know, it just, that's the, that's the pro, because you like, you yeah. deliberate, you, oh, let's warm up indoors. yeah. But you got no. We went out, and it was very um, because it was still, and the the snow had sort of stopped, and then it sort of was on and off during the game. But there was no breeze, and I've played in colder conditions, yeah, in Canberra than what it was that day. Because when the breeze gets up down there, and it was sleeting one day, we were playing. I think we we're playing might have been Newcastle. And there's another term we played on a Friday night. That was cold. When it's rain, it's windy, and it's coming from the mountains. That's that's when it's cold. It wasn't so much that that snow game. Yeah, man, it's a feeling I don't miss. And I, and man, I, you know, like you say, you get used to it. I've yeah. gone soft now. Yeah. Like I'll be around Sydney. I'll yeah. be like, oh, a bit chilly today. Yeah. Like, geez, I've got to check myself. <laughs> like, that's, well, when I that's, first that's moved not to me Sydney, talking. I first moved to Sydney. Our first winter down here, I was walking around in shorts and t-shirt. Yeah. And everyone's sort of looking at you like, aren't you cold? You go, mate, no. I've spent 14 years in Canberra. I'm not cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not cold. Well, speaking of um, uh, England, you had you did have many um, 
representative games, re- tours that you mm. that you went on. Um, you, you would have been a part of the, the Super League uh, yeah, World Club Challenges yeah. where they were back and forth. Um, I, I met as an English boy, but that was like amazing. The, yeah. the NRL players are coming. Like St. Helens played the Warriors, they played Cronulla. I can't remember who else they played, but I remember just being like, whoa, this yeah. is so good. Like getting to see NRL players up front live, it was, yeah, some pretty cool memories to, to, to see that, but probably more on the on the tour side of things. Um, some good times had. Yeah, it was. My first tour was 1990. So we were coming off the back of winning our second premiership and going across to England. Um, was that the Invincibles? No. No, it wasn't. No, they were 82, 86. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. yeah sorry. They were 82, yeah. 86. Um, and we actually lost the first test. So that was the only game we lost on tour. Um, but we – I missed the first test because I broke my hand. I broke my hand in a fight. Can you believe it? <laughs> on, the, on the footy field or – Yeah, on the footy field, yeah. We're playing Leeds. And Mark McGaw got into a fight and there was two on one. So I went in to help him. And a bloke by the name of Phil Ford, uh, I punched him in the head. And I broke my hand straight away. And I'm not a fighter. Oh, because this is in the days of so club, play, game, club, play club game, Tuesday, Wednesday, yeah. test match, yeah. Saturday. So, so I broke my hand. So I missed the first test at uh, Wembley. And, oh. of course, it was the old Wembley. Yes. So you're thinking, oh, geez, I might never get another shot at this uh, ground. And um, anyway, we got beaten and then we went to Old Trafford in that famous test match in 1990. Is that you... the the wonder try at the end? Yeah. Was yeah. it Ricky Stewart scored yeah. it? Or no, did Ricky he set Mal Meninga up. Yeah. Yeah. And off the back of um, we were behind, uh, Rick had thrown an intercept. I think it was Paul O'Loughlin scored. Yes. And then Ricky threw a dummy, ran down the field and Mal bumped – might have been off you. I don't know whether it was him or, or someone else. Anyhow, it was the winger. And, um, yeah, just sort of bumped him out of the road and got it and scored and we ended up, you know, getting that game and winning it and going on and winning the series. Mm. Um, do you have any special memories from those tours? And uh, Like, obviously, you um, to be part of the, the test team is, is incredible, but obviously yeah. everyone loves a, a good tour story. Who was your, your roommate? <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, Ricky was my roommate on the on the first tour, um, so that was that was good. And plus, yeah, yeah your mates, so it's it's pretty easy to get on with. Um, tour stories. Nah, this. Nah, there, there were, well, there was one night, but this is on ninety four. We were actually staying at the same hotel as the Aussie cricket team, and they were playing in Leeds and we were there the night they won the Ashes. So we were able to celebrate with them back at the hotel. So that was a pretty spe- uh, special um, special night. But I think that was more 90, 97, sorry, that was 97, 90, not 94. It was 97 during the Super League. Um, yeah. Test, uh, Super League games where we were over there playing for Canberra. Yeah. Yeah, so so that was pretty special. I'm just trying to think on tours. Like, you know what it's yeah, like so when you're, much, tour, yeah. you're just out, mm. you know, you're having a good time, you're, you're young, you're playing footy, experience different cultures and, yeah, it was – we had yeah. a ball. Do you, obviously, you, you, you've coached um, Origin and you get what the beast that is now. But when you were playing, wearing that green gold was – the pinnacle, right? Yeah, Am I right in saying yeah, that? Yeah, 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 most definitely. Um, do, you, do you think there should be an ambition to have that be the way it should be now? Or be, be it like that these yeah, days? I, I think it always even, should be. Even though the fact that you've coached Origin, you mm. get the, the, the magic yeah. around it. Well, Origin is the toughest arena I've ever played in. Toughest footy... Um, ultra competitive um, and it's a real test of your ability and courage and mentality to when things aren't going right and you're buggered, you just got to find something. Um, but p- 
playing for Australia is the highest honour you can get. It's representing your country. Not everyone can do it and not everyone gets to do it. So you should aspire to it as a, as a young man or, or a young uh, woman or whatever sport you play. So, uh, yeah, I, I think definitely. Uh, I don't know whether it's ever changed though, Jimmy. I, I, I don't know. Certain, Origin certainly the toughest footy I've ever played. So I, th- I think it has. I reckon if you speak to most players today, like or, or young players, mm. that they they'd have aspirations to play for New South Wales or for Queensland. Mm. When I think if you were to speak to players of your generation, mm. to be like, I want to play for Australia one yeah. day. I don't know if there's that level of ambition, yeah. and it's on as big a pedestal as, as what it once was. Like. Yeah, you know, we, don't, we don't really hear about, like, and part of that is media driven, like speaking to, oh, you must be excited to play for Australia in this yeah. tri series coming up. You know, there's no promotion around it. Yeah. It's not got the like, same no, level of importance, no. you know, but, you know, as soon as a ball's kicked, you take you back to some of the trials. Yeah. Oh, we've got a bolter here. Yeah. We've got an origin bolter for New South Wales, like in the trials, like, yeah. n- no one's saying we've got a bolter for the Aussie team. Yeah, no, I, I understand your point there, but I, I, I don't know. I think it must come down to the individual as well. You know, it might be in a different era, but um, I think there's more promotion around yeah. state of origin. So the focus is obviously always there, and it is the biggest showpiece game we have. Yeah. So you can't get away from that. But I think, I think if you ask someone if they played. 15 test match, uh, 15 origin games for New South Wales or Queensland and they never played for Australia, I think they'd have a regret. I, I think they'd want to play for the green and gold. Yeah, I, I know speaking to a number of, you know, the, the lads that went on the previous World Cup and they, they, they loved it. Mm. Like, fun time together away yeah. with your mates. Not the same old school tours no. from, from well, yesteryear think, yeah. with the, yeah. you know, the you almost... Well, Squad of four th- mid thirties, forty players back then. Oh two, no, there would have been twenty six. Oh, tw- oh, oh right, okay. So maybe you'd have been backing up. Yeah, there were some players that backed up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think Terry Lamb's the only guy that has went on uh, went on a tour and played every game. He played every game in eighty two. Did he? Yeah, uh, 80, 82 or eighty six, whatever it was, whatever two. Uh, might have been, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever tour it was, either eighty two or eighty six. Ter- Terry Lamb's the only player that's ever played in every game on tour. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, speaking representative football, all things state of origin. You coached that team uh, through a number of series. Uh, yet you weren't your only previous coaching experience had been um, for in in the city country games yep. for, for country. Yep. Um. What was behind you getting that job? It's obviously something you wanted, but um, did you realise? Did you realise how big it was going to be going into it? Oh yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, I think when you've been around State of Origin mm. for a long period of time, you you understand how big the build up is. Mm. You understand the pressure that's on everybody. But as a co- as and a coach, though. Uh, Do you think it's is it is it what's well, the differences between state of origin pressure player versus state of origin pressure coach? Oh, I think I think uh, as a player you get you get a bigger say in the outcome of the game. Um, as a coach, you can do your your prep, but then you're offloading it to other people to try and um, deliver what you need. Um, so yeah, you you feel it. More as a as a coach than a than a player, um, and coaching at that level and in that game, um, it would be different to coaching and teaching how you would NRL. Um, you know, you're getting the best players. You 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 bring them into camp, and you know you you're not getting a lot of time to work on skills. <laughs> you know. And you're not getting a lot of time to do certain things. But what you can do with them is obviously come up with a good plan, get the right people with the right attitude and get the people that want to compete hard. Um, Because for me, 
at that level, it's not about the fancy player. It's not about the set piece. It's not about the double cutout or the triple cutout. It's about you playing and most origin points at times in a tough origin contest comes down to one individual breaking the line and someone, when he's got no energy, just finds his way to support and you can pass it to him and he may score a try, you know. Um, so so you, you, it, it's just a, a, a test of your character, a test of your mental capabilities to compete as hard as you can and bringing things that we spoke about before, those no talent required effort plays. And if you get that right and you want to do the right thing by the team and then your natural skill can take over and you provide that right environment for them, you, you, you can have success. Mm -hmm. well, were you stressed uh, in the box? You obviously you yeah. come across very – you spoke about one of those things, have fun, be, yeah. enjoy. Um, you come across a very joy joyful person. Yeah. Like full of life, but when you're in that box, and, and even in the build-up, did, yeah. did you get affected by the stress? I yeah, I well, I think you do. I, I think it's hard to sort of put um, and, and park the, the stress away because you realise the importance of the game and you realise the importance it has in your state. So you feel like everyone wants you to win, which they do, and you you feel that when you're not not doing so well but like anything when you're winning if you win a game it, it, it feels great great relief um, but I think you learn to over time that you can't be focused on worrying about anything else other than and I know it's cliched and I know coaches always throw it out there and when you interview them what I do now you, you want to try and get a response but I know exactly what they're going through all they can do is is make sure they prepare you as best they possibly can and if they've done that they've, they've done their job because at the end of the day you have to be in control you got to be in control in the box you got to come up with some massive decisions in the box um, and you got to be able to stay focused you got to think on your feet um, you got to have good support around you um, and as a player it's amazing when you're in the contest. You're not. You're just playing. You, you, just, you don't think. You, you do don't know. You're just playing. You just. You're just playing. You. You're comfortable in that chaos right, as a yeah, player. You, you feel comfortable, yeah. and you yeah. feel like I know my job. I know what I have to do. Give me anything. I'll do. It. I'll, I'll, I'll. I'll know. I'm happy. I'll know the next, yeah. I might not always get it right. Yeah. But I'll know what to yeah. do. But but as a coach, sometimes you get some challenges thrown up, and then you put under that stress and you've got to make those decisions and you've got to make them in a split second uh and that's always a, a challenge there yeah it, it sure would be and no doubt from your, your your time um as the coach of this state of new south wales um you would have done systematic reviews of each series it on those reviews or looking back um is there much you would have changed in terms of setting the environment, big decisions yeah. that you think you, you you perhaps may have gone a different? Possibly not. No, it's it's amazing, you know, when when you look back on it, there's just critical moments in a game. That was the turning point. Um, I think the only time I was ever really disappointed in the game, we we got smashed in 2015. It, it was game three and that was the only time I've ever, I've, I was really disappointed. What were you um, disappointed with? Well, I, I was disappointed in they just outworked us and were better than us in everything that they did. And, for, you know, we, we tried just to build our game on, on effort um, and not being outworked. So, and, and there was, I think, I think there were four or five games where we just lost, I think it was by one or two points. I, I, I don't think there was much in a lot of those games, but that one we got hammered and that one sort of hurt and, and hit home. Um, yeah, you can overanalyze as well, but I always think that, you know, what you did at the time was what you felt was right. You, you can't change history, you can't change the past. Um, yeah, there's probably learnings that you take out of everything, um, but yeah, no, I, I was I was 
quite happy with how everything unfolded. We just, in critical moments, we just didn't come up with the right plays. And they were good enough to but, take advantage of them. Or is that yeah. a case of the, the, the right plays weren't executed? Because we are an outcomes-based yeah. industry in terms of media. Uh, we, we base our emotions on the outcome, right? Yeah. So we win or lose, and that's how we go home, yeah. go home and, and, and feel yeah. the the ecstasy of a victory yeah. or the you know the devastating crushing yeah. nature of a defeat yeah. but that's the outcome but then the processes that go that go into the outcome yeah. that in terms of decision environment team selection you know yeah. bench rotation yeah. um time in camp time away from home, yeah. like all these different things yeah. that you know impact the, the all the variables that we can control yeah. that impact the outcome were you satisfied with all those variables that you as the coach um, yeah. were the gatekeeper of? Or, or, or you're the – I often yeah. look at, like, coaches and leaders as, like, the, they're like gardeners that look yeah. after the garden and set the environment to the right amount of sunlight, yeah. the amount of water, the amount of adversity, yeah. the temperature, yeah. oxygen, CO2. Like, that's what gardeners do. Yeah. Soil, oh, blah blah blah, yeah. but, and that's what coaches do, and especially in that situation where you've got the best of the best, yeah. given that environment, the decision making tools, but it's outcome yeah. focused. Yeah, now I've always been um, very, very happy, mm. very, very happy, um, and like anything, though, you realise that you're going to get criticised for whatever decision or you, you make during the game or whatever happens in the lead up. Um, that's on the head coach and, and that's fine. Everyone can have a have an opinion. Um, but at the end of the day, when you know you've done everything that you possibly can to get people in the right mindset and have them ready to play and they go out there and play, there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser. We all want to win and there's times that we will win. There'd be times when you're challenged when, you, when, you, when you've lost and we go looking for the reasons why Sometimes um, the reason why is only a small thing. Sometimes it could be a bigger thing. Um, but for me, I was always happy with how we prepared a footy team because I think every time we prepared a footy team, I expected to win. Mm. And gave them the best possible opportunity oh, most definitely. to have that outcome. But most right? definitely, yeah. yeah. We, we, we would have them as wound up as mm. you... <laughs> Yeah, you possibly yeah, can for a, you've you've got the control a, to a few number yeah. of a number of dials there. Mm. Hard to get it perfect, but yeah. it's the best as what you see fit for the given yeah. situation. Um, you come up against one of the greatest ever Origin teams with the the Queensland side yeah. you played against. What was it about them? Do you feel um, set them apart? Um, I, I think. Well I, well, I do know. Their decision-making under pressure was as good as I've seen because you could work on things at training and you could do it 95% of the time. But the minute you clocked off doing your job against them, they would just find you out. So they were very, um, very, very intelligent footy team as well as being a talented team and as well as being a hungry team and if you throw all that into the mix um, they're going to be hard to beat and I think while anyone can win a game if if you've got a talented team and they're working hard and they've got smart decision makers in their team they're going to be difficult to beat difficult to beat what do you make of the narrative that sometimes gets pushed around that it means more to Queenslanders. Yeah, oh, look, I, oh, I don't buy into that because I don't think it, it does. Um, I think that that's a narrative that they like to use when they're winning. You know, they've gone through periods where they haven't had the success um, and there's always talk about origin being over when Queensland lose two or three in a row. So I, I don't engage in that. Um, what I do know is that you've got to create your own bond within that group that you have and make people understand that they are bigger than the individual 
um, well, the, the game is bigger than the individual and, and it's about the state and it's about who we play for and why we play for. Um, and and for me, every sort of player that I've ever picked, I reckon, uh, has always felt that. They've always felt a connection. Um, but, you know, I get back to, um, you know, like a classic example when you talk about you know, players being smart on the field under pressure in big moments. Like little thing like we would work hard on, um, you know, in the 30 to 40 metre zone, tackle four, tackle three, watch out for Cameron Smith, left foot, he's going to jump and kick. We would do that 95% of the time, jump right to stop his left foot kick, but the moment you didn't do it, he'd do it, roll the ball from 50 out, 60 out, put you on your goal line, that chase was down there, that hemi for four or five, and then you kick it under pressure, they, 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 you know, or, or, or fine touch or whatever needed to be done, they would do it. Little things like that were just game-changing um, and just very good at it. Um, and for, for us, we, we competed hard, but at times we, you know, we just weren't good enough. But we expected to win. We just didn't get those decisions right. Do you think, obviously, all the things that, all the ingredients of a successful team. Do you think it was to New South Wales' de- detriment that they had so many players to choose from? Like the choice paradox where <sighs> Queensland had less players to choose yeah. from and therefore they almost by default had to stay together for longer. And, you yeah. know, if you've got two players going for one position, you know, there's not much not a hard choice or maybe there is. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think I think you always want competition for spots. You always want that depth, don't you? You always want people knowing that. I think you'd assume, someone, you'd assume that, yeah. yeah. Um, but what it can create is um, a chop and change. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, you know, again, going back to that, uh, we react to the outcome, yeah, and not what we did. Like, yeah, what, no, that's, you know, a, that's so a fair point. That that outcome reaction mm. of we've lost, mm. we must make change. Yeah. They, 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 they can't react off the outcome yeah. based theory, well, well, yeah, off the yeah, off the yeah, outcome yeah, they, that, because they yeah, don't have yeah. the they don't have the ability no. to. They and don't. That, they, that, it's not an option. No, but that's that's one thing you can't do. You can't be influenced by outside noises. Um, yeah. We're commentators now. <laughs> I'd be stunned if a coach listened to what you and I had to say. I reckon they do, you know. You they don't agree. Oh, sorry, they they listen, but um, they yeah, don't. Unless they rang and yeah. asked. Yeah, but I don't but, think but they if, act if they're off just it. listening to yeah. what we're saying, that, yeah, they might. They might listen, mm. but I don't think they're going to react off what we mm. say. And you need to make sure as a coach you, you believe in what you're doing. And ideally when you pick that squad to start with, that's the team you want to – move forward with um but obviously injuries can change that and if someone doesn't perform as well as what you wanted them to um and it was a difficult choice in the first place whether you went with him or went with someone else i think that's where you may look to change but is that but if looking I had, at the outcome rather than well okay well i've picked this yeah. person because i've recognized something within them yep okay the outcome wasn't the desired one yep but then maybe due to a, a number of factors yeah. um, or a number of variables that yeah. I can, can't control yeah. and he can't control has affected the level of performance yeah. and therefore the outcome of the team and yeah. the individual, okay, well, I'm going to change. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I think what you tend to do, as I said, you you, you pick that squad that you, you want to go with and you expect them to win and you expect that everyone's going to play well and you move forward into the next game. Uh, injuries aside, then you've got to analyse the performance of the, the player and analyse exactly what he brought to the table and did he do the job that you wanted him to do. Um, and then you also take into consideration, you know, when you made that decision, was it a, a long-term decision on him thinking, yeah, he's going to be there for the three or was it a decision where it was between him and someone else and you were... Uh, Tossing, turning, and then you went, no, I'll give this bloke the first opportunity. And sometimes those guys are the ones that, 
if they haven't performed are the ones that, mm. that, that miss out next time. Are you conscious of the unintended impact of a decision like that? So perhaps with the rest of the squad, uh, he, you know, we're all on notice. He doesn't perhaps believe in us. Yeah. Or, or even the uh the narrative that could be picked up of like he doesn't know what his best team is he doesn't know what he's doing yeah yeah i, I think that is always like, do you factor all that in ah uh, t- to be fair mate once i once i in the lead up to picking a side i, I can be a little not a l- little bit unsure but there might be someone that i'm unsure about but then once i've made that decision I go with it, and and it's good as gold. You feel confident. Mm. Um, so I never never doubt myself when I've made any decision. I'll always I'll always back it. Um, and at the but end is that of the something day, you have to consider, like the impact on the group, and especially the the impact that a decision at origin level has, especially when it comes to mm. teams to sele- team selection. Yeah, it's like the sp- Spotlight. Yeah. Well, the goes difficult insane. one is the difficult one is when you're telling someone they're not in the team. Yeah. Or they're sorry, they're being dropped from the team. Yeah. Um, that that's always a hard one, and then depending on you know the experience level of that player, depending on if it's his first game, you know, it still affects everyone differently. Um, and they're conversations that no one likes to have, but you've you've got to do it. But you've got to explain the reason, and sometimes though. Um, it's a it's a short conversation, and sometimes, depending on the individual, it can be a longer conversation. But they're never easy. No. What's the What's Laurie Daly doing the day after an Origin series win versus a day after an Origin series loss? Oh dear. Uh, well, you got a smile on your face, you got plenty of energy, and you move around very quickly. Um, after a loss, you just feel the weight of the state on you and you feel drained um, and then you you start to uh, analyse your, your performance and analyse the preparation that you put the team through um, and that can be challenging um, and then possibly, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours later you start to have a look at tape. I'm not one to go straight into looking at tape, I need to calm down and (laughs) get my thoughts and analyse my own performance first and foremost Um, and try and work out, you know, what happened or or what we did well. Um, And then once I've established that, then I'll go and have some – I'll go and have a look at the tape and see what else I can come up with. Yeah. What do you like being around your friends and your family after something like that? Oh, when you win, you're on a a high – you, when you lose, you don't want to go out. You take it, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's, it's it's one of those ones. Yeah. You know, you, you feel you feel embarrassed. You feel like you've let people down, mm. um, and you've got that really steely, determined look. That you know, I I, I can do this. I I can get it done. You know, we just got to have everyone buy in, and and you want to try and turn it around. Um, but the margins are small. And I think the highs are high in rugby league and the lows are definitely low, but that's why we love it because it's our drug. That's, that's what we like doing. The, and there's certain people that are really attracted to that, knowing it's <laughs> going to be this ve- very varied range of emotions yeah, well, and yeah. out of your control to a lot of the, well, to some extent. Um, yeah. Do you think you could have kept going or should have been, you should have kept going for a little longer? Uh, look, at the end of the day, um, I was um, I was disappointed with the decision, um, but I can't argue with the fact that because we were um, – well, didn't win, then it's a results-driven business. So they had every right to sort of move me on. Um, but it's still sort of hard to take. Um, because you feel like you've sort of on the verge of sort of turning it around and I felt like we'd sort of started to establish a good platform of 
um, you know, Queensland were sort of at that period where I thought their dynasty was coming to an end um, and I thought ours was about to, to start. Um, but you never get everything in life you want. Um, and I think that's what makes footy players um, in a better position to handle adversity because when you've played sport at a high level, you, you've highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows. So you've experienced it for, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever you, you play for. And then if you get into coaching, you're going to experience that as well. So, so yeah, because I've experienced the highs and lows, I could, I could deal with it, but it's still disappointing for sure. Yeah. You know, you're, you're still um, upset, um, but you, I think you move on pretty quickly. I, th- I think that's the one thing about footy in general is that you, you can move on pretty quickly. How were you watching the the first series? First series without um, without coaching them. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, was it easy to let go? Or um, was it f- yeah, it was easy to let go, but also you felt a little bit of oh, geez, I wish I was still there. Yeah, you know, and I, I think that's only human nature. Of course, it is. Um, you know, you 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 wanted to you wanted to still be involved, mm. um, and I think. To see some of the, what what made me happy about that series the next year was some of those players that we'd given an opportunity to that they won, and I, I really enjoyed seeing the look on their faces because you know I knew the criticism that they'd pro- you know, copped the previous year or two, so to see them win was was pretty good. Yeah. Um. Before we get into the the last four questions that we do for each and every guest. What's the future looking like? What's what? What are your aspirations? So for me, it's it's all about trying to uh, live the best life I possibly can. Um, what does that look like? Well, it, it's spending time with family, um, and my kids now are in their twenties. Um, they range from you better get this right, <laughs> twenty seven to twenty one. There's one twenty four year old in there as well, um, and seeing what their future holds. Um, just enjoying myself um, and, as I said before, looking after myself but but in, uh, having a bit of fun, staying energised and just making sure that I can live a long and healthy life and spend it with the people I want to spend it with. Um, I think as you get older you learn that, that family is so important and friends and you've got to have a good circle, good network and... You don't have to include anyone else into that network, <laughs> you know, because you're happy with what you've already got. Um, but, yeah, f- for me, I, I haven't got um, high goals other than making sure my family mm. um, are well looked after and I can enjoy a lot of time with them into the future. Well, you, you've earned that right to um, have an enjoyable time with your family mm. you, you really have um and sport can give us that as well it, it can jimmy and, and one thing we've sort of learnt when you have um you know setbacks along the way and you lose loved ones along the way is that life can be very short and while we're here you've got to enjoy it and yeah. you've got to spend time with the people you love most and i think that as you get older you you appreciate that a lot more yeah, I'm feeling you. I'm feeling <laughs> you. Um, yeah, so like I say, we do the, the four questions um, for each and every guest. Uh, first part of that is the dream spine. Uh, this question is brought to you by Tui's. Tui's are all about teamwork. Mm-hmm. Every team needs a top quality spine. Now, there's no no rules around this. Um, coached, played with, played against, coached against, witnessed in the, the commentary box. Um, what would be your dream 1679? You can throw yourself in there no, as well. No, no, you... no. My, my, my dream would be the ones I never got to play with and okay, I admired. That... Okay. So my fullback would be Billy Slater. Yeah. I, I think he just revolutionised the way that the game was played. Um, always admired Cameron Smith with his calmness and his decision-making. So he's your nine? So he's my nine. Geez, two Queenslanders, yeah. mate. Brett Kenny. Ah, right. Was my number six. Um, just thought he was such a wonderful player. 
In fact, I always thought that he was – well, should have got me out of the match more times than Wally. <laughs> <laughs> As a young New South Welshman watching. Uh, so, yeah, he, he was just a, a freak bird. And then Tommy, Tommy Rudonicus. Oh. Would have loved to have played with Tommy because I reckon he would have inspired everyone. He was nuts, that he, wasn't he? he was oh, he was captain nuts, mate. He was, and I was lucky enough to have him as coach of the Origin. And he was such a passionate and proud man. Um, and he would do anything for his teammates. So I reckon he'd be another one that I'd love to have him as mine. Well, that's a, that's a. I don't know how that combined. No. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy and Bert. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, uh, they're, they're, they're the Billy and Cam Smith in there in amongst yeah. it as well. It's yeah. uh that's quite the combination, mate. Yeah. Thanks for that. That's um that's really interesting. Um yeah, big thanks to Suez for that. Um like we say, spines make the team where st- sorry, spines. Make the team work, don't they? And obviously, do. twoies are all about teamwork as well. Um, if football didn't exist, yep. this one is going to interest me with you because um, coming from such a remote mm-hmm. part of the of the country, if football didn't exist. What, what do you think you'd be doing? Uh, well, this might surprise you, Jimmy. I'd always wanted to be a policeman. Seriously? Yeah. Yep. Always wanted to be a police officer. I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid. I don't know whether it was just the uniform or whether it was the authority. Oh, I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, I always wanted to try and help people. Um, and, yeah, a police officer was what I wanted to be. That's cool. Mm. Hmm. Um, a sliding doors moment that you um, think about the – the other thing happening. So for me, it might be uh, if I'd have made the decision to stay in England, not come to mm. Australia. Oh, what what would life have been like? Is there, yeah. is there th- something that sticks out? Yep. Uh, well, there is. Um, in ni- so in 1987, I'd made my debut for Canberra. But to be a regular in the starting side, I had to be uh, in front of a centre pairing of Peter Jackson and Mal Meninga. And I'd trained hard in the off-season and we played in a, I think it was a sevens tournament in Parramatta at the start of the 88 season. And Mal broke his arm again. So Mal broke his arm and I played well in that sevens series and then got an opportunity in the trials. And I started the year in first grade and then I never left. So that was probably a sliding doors moment for me because if Mal hadn't have broken his arm, then I possibly would have been still playing in under 23s or reserve grade. Yeah, and where that would have – that's interesting, that. Mm. Where would yeah. that have led you? So I was sort of 18 at the time and got an opportunity through, through Mal breaking his arm. Well, quite possibly. It, it's not – uh, difficult to imagine you'd have gone to another football club. P- possibly, you know, it, it would yeah. have been a, a, a thing where you mightn't have been get, given an opportunity mm. and you might have felt like, oh, well, I possibly could move on here. Mm. But, yeah, that was a sliding door moment for me. Unfortunately for Mal, he broke his arm again because he did it in 87, did it in that tournament. So it just sort of opened up the door for me. Mm, it didn't look back. Um, the most interesting person that you've met along the way? Um, the one that I always found fascinating and I'd always loved having a chat to him was the great Shane Warne. Um, I've met a lot of um, people in my time, uh, but Warney was someone that I just um, was lucky enough to do a couple of things with him. Um, and it was always a laugh. I remember, <laughs> <It was. laughs> you know, I remember um, myself, Wayne Carey, and and um, Shane did a must have been a Nike promotion here in Sydney. Um, so just seeing those guys and people from other sports that you really revered, and they were two. Um, used to love watching uh, Wayne play for North Melbourne. 
um, and then watching Warney bowl for Australia. So you know, and they're two sports that I that I love. So to actually spend a bit of time with those guys was was good. Um, but yeah, no, Warney. I, I tell you a quick story with Warney um, during that nineteen or ninety seven um, Ashes tour. We we're staying in the same hotel, and we were there the night that they won. But previous to that, Warney was not out batting, and we'd been on the night out. So we we come home and he's leaving. And one of the boys said, uh, "That's Warney going out." Isn't he not out overnight? And one of the boys said, Warnie, aren't you not out overnight batting? And he goes, I'm going out, boys. Not my job to get runs. (laughs) 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 That was all. Oh, "Oh, that's the king. (laughs) That is the king. (laughs) Oh, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. That's a a good way to wrap it up, Boz. Um, Really enjoyed um, talking with you, mate. It's been uh, a fascinating conversation and great insight as well to um, especially your time coaching. it's not always easy, especially uh, when you're on the on the losing end a few yeah. times. You did get that that glory in fourteen, which was there at that <laughs> game where Hocko scored. It was oh, it's, uh, fantastic, wasn't mm, it? I was cheering, but uh, it was fa- that's fascinating insight, yeah. mate. And um, even the the stuff that you do with radio as well. That's it. it it's pretty cool to to hear a little bit behind the scenes about giving an opinion on, um, yeah, not your chosen sport. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you uh, for joining us on, on the bar round. It's uh, very much appreciated. And as well, sorry, big lesson. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. 100%, Jimmy. It's um, very important for everyone to realise that. Thank you, Laurie Daly. Good on you, mate. Thanks, Thanks Jimmy. Man. Cheers.